Good afternoon and welcome to Walker and Dunlop's Wednesday webinar. I'm Susan Weber, your moderator. I would like to welcome Willie Walker and Mike Facitelli, who will discuss the state of the commercial real estate sector. Thank you for joining us. And now I will turn the call over to Willie. Thank you, Susan, and uh, welcome to another Walker webcast. Uh, if it's Wednesday, it's the Walker webcast. Uh, I had the honor of having Dr. Wayne Frederick, president of Howard University on the webcast last week. Uh, Dr. Frederick was extremely insightful and inspirational in his thoughts on the COVID pandemic, heading back to school in the fall, and racial justice in America. Uh, if you missed my discussion with Dr. Howard, uh, Dr. Frederick, excuse me, um, you can watch the replay on Walker Nillop's YouTube channel. Uh, I'm thrilled to have my friend and commercial real estate legend, Mike Facitelli, joining me today. I, I told Susan Weber, who just introduced us, uh, that Mike was going to bring a huge audience, and sure enough, the number of people registered for today's webcast is the second highest we've ever had uh, for the Walker webcast. Um, Mike and I were joking yesterday that we need to make today's discussion really great so it surpasses the total views of my discussion with Barry Sternlich, which so far is at 25,000. So no pressure, Mike, on our conversation today. <laughs> um, we have Dr. Larry Sabato, founder and director of the University of Virginia Center for Politics, coming on the webcast next week. Uh, Dr. Sabato has spoken at the Walker Nellop Summer Conference here in Sun Valley several times, and um, he's always incredibly insightful on the political landscape. I remember a number of years ago, back in 2007, when Rudy Giuliani and Hillary Clinton both had commanding leads uh, in the national polls for president, and Dr. Sabato stood up at our conference and said that neither Rudy Giuliani nor Hillary Clinton would be their party's nominee. Uh, and since that prophetic statement back in the summer of 2007, we've listened to Dr. Sabato's insights very closely. Uh, talking about politics, uh, there's a great deal of focus on the next stimulus bill right now. Uh, a couple quick thoughts on that. First, there will definitely be a bill. Uh, it'll likely be over a trillion dollars. Um, we used to say a couple billion here and a couple billion there, and it's real money. Now it's sort of a couple trillion here and a couple trillion there, and it's real money. Um, it will be uh, framed and negotiated during the final week of July. Uh, Leader McConnell has planned it that way. He didn't want a lot of activity during June and July, so it'll all go down in the final week of July, and it'll likely get passed and signed by the president um, at, before the end of the month. Um, one of the big questions that many real estate investors have, and particularly multifamily uh, investors have, is, um, the concern that the bill uh, will have some type of extension of the $600 a week supplemental unemployment benefits that was included in the CARES Act. Uh, Senate Republicans have been voicing their concerns that that benefit is a disincentive for people to return to the workforce. Uh, but from many discussions that I've been having with lawmakers on both sides of the aisle, uh, I think uh, there will be some type of extension, uh, whether it's in a step down form of $400 or $450 a week or something else. Um, I think with uh, the number of people in America still unemployed, uh, both Republicans and uh, Democrats will want some extension of those unemployment benefits. As well, Walker and Dunlop and others in the multifamily industry have been working pretty hard to get some type of rental assistance program included in the next stimulus package. Um, it's super important, particularly if there is not an extension of the unemployment benefits. And then finally, we've been working pretty hard to try and convince lawmakers that the next stimulus bill not include a similar eviction moratorium that the CARES Act had over properties that have a Fannie, Freddie, or HUD, or government-backed loan on them. Um, I met with the Joint Economic Commission last week with a bunch of senators and Republicans. And um, when I was asked uh, about this issue, I basically said to them, you haven't asked Walmart to give away free food you haven't asked Walgreens to give away free medicine, yet with an eviction moratorium, you're essentially asking landlords to give away housing. Um, and I strongly encourage them to solve the issue of housing uh, through an extension of the stepped up unemployment benefits or some type of rental assistance program. And clearly, if they give people the ability to stay in their homes or stay in their apartment, there's no reason to worry about an eviction or implement an eviction moratorium because people will be able to stay in place. Um, so with that as the back, um, I want to turn to Mike. Uh, Mike, when um, you decided that you were going to leave Renato, um, Steve Roth uh, was quoted as saying, um, Mike is family. This was entirely Mike's decision. Uh, he works like an animal, and each year at this job and running a company of this scale and size and complexity is like dog years. 
So you were at Bernado for uh, 16 years, which means that you were there for 112 dog years. Um, you're looking pretty good, my friend, for someone who was at a company <laughs> for 112 years. Um, let me let me turn to your upbringing first before we dive into where the markets are today. You you grew up in Rhode Island, the son of immigrant Italian parents, a seamstress and a factory worker. Um, and you said you came from a very poor, poor family, or felt poor. The key components to being poor but not feeling poor. Well, I mean, we we I just I didn't know any better then, and my mother and father were. Uh, workers and we had plenty of food because she was Italian and that was important. So we uh, we ate well. Um, I went to public schools my whole time, so I didn't feel particularly deprived. But as I learned what what uh, that we were, you know, I think lower middle class probably is a good way to describe our upbringing. One of the things that I've always known about you is that for someone who has had such incredible success, um, you're a very humble person. And you once said that your mom told you, be nice to people on the way up because they're the same people you'll meet on the way down. Um, not that you're on the way down, but have you run into any of those people recently? <laughs> uh, that's a, uh, you know, look, you, you're always better off being nice to people, right? Why not? And um, I do think, you you know, coming from a blue collar background and family, many of our, you know, it's blue collar. You know, I, I grew up in that way. So I think everybody, uh, I try to treat everyone the same and, I think that's one of the great things. If you get success and you can give back, um, you know, that's great. You know, if you, uh, you have to, you know, a lot of people are worried about this. You point out their jobs at the next 400 or $600 paycheck. So, or, or, or a CARES Act that they're going to get or not get. So I was very fortunate to have, um, have a, uh, a good, lot of good breaks. And I, why not treat people really nicely and really well? Because it's just a lot. That's how I, that's who I am actually. Um, I'm assuming that when you up at Harvard Business School, uh, there weren't a whole lot of other University of Rhode Island graduates who were in your, uh, in your section or in class. What was it like uh, showing up at HBS the first day and uh, looking around the room with a whole bunch of uh, Harvard and Yale graduates? I was scared. I thought, I thought they made a, I, you know, I always say that they, they, um, you know, they haven't gone to public high school, the University of Rhode Island, there were no other uh, compatriots from that school at that thing. And, you know, you, you look around, everyone's from Ivy League educations or fancy backgrounds or undergrad. And everyone kept saying to me, you know, you're from Rhode Island. Did you go to Brown? I said, no. Why not? I got rejected at Brown. They, the summer I thought Brown was a state school in Rhode Island. And, uh, and so, you know, I think that candidly, for me, it was a, um, an eye-opening experience because I met a lot of great people there. And, um, I did feel a little intimidated at first, quite frankly, and uh, just worked my butt off to sort of get, you know, get, get their respect. So after going to McKinsey, um, which, as we both know, recruits a ton of people out of HBS, um, but isn't a place where people go to make their fortunes, uh, Goldman Sachs was, I guess, expanding out into some type of experiment where they were bringing in lawyers and engineers and people with kind of non-traditional finance backgrounds. What, what was it that made you jump into and uh, uh, decide that finance was where you wanted to, to, to sort of take a risk and also look for opportunity? Well, you know, um, I had a bunch of friends out of business school that went to consulting like I did, and a bunch of friends that went to investment banking. And you see, like investment banking was much more lucrative. Um, it, it, uh, you know, people of my three years out were, were making a lot more money. and, and Quite frankly, we're involved in a lot of interesting things. McKinsey was like a PhD. It's an incredible organization, really smart people. I was an engineer, as you point out, undergraduate. And so that background was sort of more common than McKinsey. It wasn't that common at Goldman. And, uh, I, you know, I kind of felt like I was wanted to be more transactional oriented. And Goldman was far more transactional oriented than McKinsey was. So, you know, I also... You know, I, I kind of felt like an experiment at Harvard Business School and an experiment at Goldman coming in. They needed a sort of, you know, a public school street kid kind of thing to, to kind of rough around the edges to, to kind of round out the field. So I, I thought it was another good shot, good shot for me. I could, I could see a, a hoops player from URI and HBS being on the trading desk at Goldman Sachs more than I can somebody going into commercial real estate. Why would you not go to sales and trading and, and be, a, be a bond trader rather than going into commercial real estate? Well, you know, I never, the opportunities at Goldman were 
I probably had a better background to go into M&A and corporate finance, given my McKinsey background, engineering. But real estate, as you remember, Willie, was pretty nascent then. It wasn't that established. It was, it was a wild, wild west. There was a lot of characters, which is still are in it. And I thought Goldman was very insignificant in it as a, as a business. So I thought it was a much more entrepreneurial path within Goldman and much more uh, new uncharted territory. So I took a shot. I liked real estate. I always kind of thought it was a hot asset, you could touch and feel. And so I went into Goldman when it was relatively new at Goldman and not established, which was a risk, but also an opportunity in hindsight. Talk about Whitehall for a minute. Why was Whitehall so incredible? successful um you know timing was great um we had goldman had started a little uh, a, a, a principal business in the 80s and it didn't do very well and i think when when um the real estate market crumbled and went to hell in the handbasket in the early 90s whitehall was kind of a derivation of the real estate market becoming dislocated and really really tough and you know we felt if we got went into the principal business and did it with our current knowledge that we had at that point and with the right skill sets of people, we could really have be be uh, be successful. It turned out it was super successful, um, and I think part of that was the concept was really good, the people were really good, but also the timing was perfect. The timing we hit, we started to invest in uh, 93, 94 timeframe in the matter of that that real estate collapse, and you know really end up with outsized returns for the net first two or three funds. Is there anything similar to Whitehall today in a investment bank i mean all the you know goldman's got their own capital they raised funds and put it to work but what was it is it makes the location of whitehall so difficult today for big banks well there's there was an awful lot of conflicts that occurred internally in, in whitehall when we had clients and competing against those clients and so the banks you know, morgan stanley also was involved mesref was pretty strong and it was it got, it, you know, those days whitehall and mesref where the two leading funds, Blackstone was pretty insignificant in those days. So, you know, I think there's conflicts, there's regulatory issues that came up over time, particularly after the uh, 08, 09 disaster. So, you know, you were navigating through, you know, some real advantages being in, in the Goldman umbrella and the Morgan umbrella, but you also had a lot of disadvantages. So I think that I, it's unlikely today you'll see those kind of firms be within those big, big financial institutions. I think that the challenges from a regulatory and conference standpoint are too great. Yeah. So it was, you left Goldman in 1996. It was pretty unusual for someone to leave Goldman as a partner, uh, particularly at that time when it was still a partnership. Um, and, uh, why'd you, why'd you end up jumping out to go to Bernardo? You know, um, it was a, it wasn't a planned decision. I had known, uh, I'd worked on the other side of, uh, of the table from Steve Roth, who was a really smart. He built a great company in, uh, in Veneto, but it was very small um, and a lot of firepower. And Steve and I got to know each other, again, on opposite sides of the table. And um, I, I turned 40 years old in September, and Steve approached me and said, you want to do this? Come in and be president and be a partner. And I said, only if we can grow that business dramatically. And I had a lot of experience at Whitehall. At Goldman, real estate never became that big of a deal. It never became, it was never a, the engine that drove that firm. So you always were on the periphery. And I thought if we're going to do real estate, um, probably the best thing to do was in a more real estate centric environment. And obviously real estate, Renato was all it was and, and in the public market. So I took a plunge. It was risky. It was highly questioned, the subject of a front page article. Uh, a lot of people called it stupid. Uh, or, but I, you know, I thought it was a good measured, a measured uh, thing, and I really was excited about working with Steve as a partner, and quite frankly, trying to build that company into something that I thought it could become, which hopefully it did become. So that was a, there was a front page article in the Wall Street Journal about you leaving Goldman and going to uh, Bernardo, and also the, the 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 pay package that you received to go across to Bernardo. Uh, but Bernardo stock didn't really move that much in the first three years you were there. And um, Goldman went public in 1999. Did you do the math in 1999 and sort of scratch your head as, as it relates to why you left Goldman and went to Bernardo? And I'm going to get to what happened to Bernardo stock in a minute, so don't worry. You're going to have the punchline here. But I'm just thinking about <laughs> that moment in 1999 when Goldman goes public and you sort of sit there and scratch your head about what you left on the table. Well, 
Um, I, you know, I might have gone to a public university, but I was always pretty good at math. <laughs> <laughs> always much better in math than English. Uh, and I would say that I would say that even if I didn't do the math, many people were doing it for me and sending it to me. So I, uh, I had a lot of people who were keeping score outside of my little uh, thing. But, you know, I, I really, you know, I thought both of them were going to be very, both financially um, acceptable to actually financially rewarding and hopefully really lucrative. And I, I didn't really compare that much one against the other. I kind of felt like we both were really good opportunities. I thought Goma would go public. Even when I left, I didn't know exactly when. It failed the first time. There was a lot of dissent, but um, I was happy for the people who stayed at Goldman. But, you know, Veneto um, was, was a, I thought, was a more singular bet and more, more our responsibility. So nobody could control our own destiny over a long period of time better. So I, I didn't really never look back. So when you, when you joined Renato, they owned 56 shopping centers, nine industrial and office buildings totaling about 12 million square feet. So while it was, you know, $3 billion in assets, it was still in, in comparison to what it is today. Well, when you left, it had 30 billion in assets, um, but it was still a relatively small company um, and grew a lot. Was there anything that you and Steve immediately did? I mean, here was Steve running it. He was plenty capable of running and had a very successful firm and made the decision to bring you in. So I'm, I'm wondering, was there anything that the two of you did that was distinct right away as it relates to the course you charted for Vernado, the types of assets you were looking at that came about once you joined and the two of you started partnering and you were running the firm on a day-to-day -day basis? Yes. Uh, you know, the, you know we, I joined Vernado. Uh, I signed my deal at Renato in December 3rd, 1996. I actually worked at Goldman transitioning. They knew I was leaving to January, but relatively quickly after joining Renato, we ended up buying the Mendic company, which had moved into New York office, which turned out to be one of the great real estate the other, or rather, you modestly say made. And that moved us into the office sector. We quickly followed that with some purchases of office buildings. They all closed by April 15th, 1997. So within a very short period of time, we had built, we had grown that small company dramatically, and we had moved into New York City dramatically, and we moved into the office business dramatically. So uh, we did, we were able to, you know, Mendick was going public. I knew Bernie and David, David Greenbaum still at Veneto and was a lifelong partner of mine. So we, we offered a very good proposition and uh, and that turned out to be a very, very important move very quickly for Veneto. Just on that of Steve bringing you on and the, the, the sort of the change in direction that took place there, here's someone who was su exceedingly successful and didn't quote unquote need to go honestly invest in such a talented executive as yourself, but made a really big bet to do so. There are very few owner entrepreneurs like Steve Roth who do that. What do you, I mean, not, it's not that people don't think about continuing to build their businesses, but they probably think, hey, I've done well, I've got plenty of assets, I'm making plenty of money, why kind of make that kind of additional investment? What was unique about Steve and his thinking? Because it obviously paid off wonderfully for him to have made that move and bring you across, but so few people actually do it if they're sitting in that CEO position with a very successful company like Renato was at that time. I think Steve was pretty secure in who he was and he wanted to grow dramatically and his background wasn't really a growth guy. Mine was much more of a growth background. I think he thought he needed somebody like me who was more outfacing to the market um, and we one plus one could equal two. I felt he could really be a great partner and really, really smart guy as you point out. And he had the courage to do it. He had the courage, the vision to do it. He wanted to be a much bigger company. Veneta was a really good company. It was just small, as you pointed out, and it had a great uh, base of assets to build from, but it, they weren't the assets attracting. It was, it was the foundation of the capital it could be deployed from, very low leverage company, and we grew that dramatically over time. And Steve had the courage and the vision to see that was better to do that and uh, was willing to share that, that kind of uh, position with a partner. And, and we were 15 years apart, so it was, it was, a, it was, it was a good relationship because it, was, it, worked, it worked. It just sometimes it just worked. If you look at Vernado's stock price from 97 to 2002, it does well, but it 
it moves along at kind of what you would expect as far as you know growth and and and, and um, returns. But then all of a sudden, you um, it kind of goes vertical uh, in 2003, and I and I went in and looked to try and figure out whether there was some semi event or acquisition. And the one thing that I came upon was the acquisition of Charles E. Smith Company in 2002. Was the was the change in the kind of returns on on Vernado based off of having done the acquisition of Charles E. Smith, or was it just what happened in the markets between 2003 and 2007 as to overall portfolio you'd assembled up until then? Just kind of curious whether Charles E. Smith was one of those seminal events or whether that just happens to be in the hit, but it was really everything you'd done up until then that started to kind of blossom. A little of both. I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to question your math because you're the host there, but I, <laughs> Venado, um, I think Venado split the stock really after I got there. So I think the stock did do really well up until the dot-com bubble. It, I think it sort of doubled. Um, and we had a really good run. We bought great assets cheaply in that 97, 98, 99 period. And then we had the dot-com bubble, if you remember, Willie, which really set everybody back. So you didn't really – and Smith came in after 9-11, which we closed January of the following year. That was a big move into D.C. So the cumulative things we really got noticed after the dot-com bubble you know, people didn't like hard assets at that time, didn't like real estate, didn't like, you remember, everybody was into eyeballs and, and, and futures and stuff. So we were out of favor for a couple of years, but 2003, we became in favor. And those cash flows we bought relatively cheaply started to really prove themselves. So I think we got a good run. That, but we had a really good run. If you look back to the stock, I think the numbers might be off half because it, it split in the first three years. So then it went down, and then it came roaring back for the cumulative effort. I think that was made on very good investments in that early late nineties period. And Smith was one of those movements and moved us into a whole nother market. And our history had been buying a platform, but then adding dramatically to that platform with that base. And that's what we did at Smith. We bought the Kemper company. We add a lot of assets to DC. So again, that people read through what we did in New York and I saw that same thing in DC. And I think that helped the stock a lot. Yeah, so um, a couple of things. First of all, you're more than welcome to correct me on my math. I just, um, you know, WMB did 5X in its first five years as a public company, so I just might have a little bit different sort of what's success and what's not. I'm sorry, it wasn't 5X. It's we'll okay. Two, three uh, <laughs> the, but so, Mike, from there, 2003 to 2007, this, your stock actually does do a 4 or 5X uh, uh, trip between 2003 and 2007. And then we get into the great financial crisis. And um, uh, basically, over the next two years, from 2007 down to 2009, the stock basically backs up to where it was pre-run up yeah. of that 5X growth. Talk for a moment about, I mean, right now, everyone's trying to make sense of the landscape. Everyone's looking for either green shoots. Everyone's sort of trying to gain conviction. Talk for a moment, because, I mean, obviously the great financial crisis is not perfectly analogous to where we are today. There are lots of things that were very different back then. But talk for a moment about going into the crisis, what you were doing as it relates to making sure that Bernardo was going to be okay, and then when you started to gain conviction that it was time to start putting money to work again. Well, yeah, that was a scary time. Um, you know, lots of stocks moved down, you know, a, a, a great deal and the volatility was really high. So first thing we did was we hunkered down and made sure we had liquidity, made sure our lines, we never ran Vernado with more than 40% debt, pretty much that was the average. And sometimes it was lower than that. Uh, and obviously debt to market cap can change really dramatically when market cap collapses. So we, we went to liquidity first. We got very conservative with our own assets. The cash flow actually did not get impacted that much. That was one of the, I think, revelations of the 0809. It, it, we were not in, in short-term assets. We had a lot of average lease duration. That was seven to 10 years. So we didn't suffer a great deal of cash flow diminution, but we did move around and, and the multiple went way down. So we didn't feel we could issue stock. We did our first fund in that point to level off our, our reputation, our platform. And we, 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 we kind of just hunkered down and went through it. I do think it was instructive. If anything, I look back at that and think one of the mistakes that we made, we could have been much more offensive coming out of that. But, you know, it was scary then. We were worried about protecting the mothership. I think we had grown to 
close to over $30 billion in assets. And, you know, we just were protect the assets first, protect your own base, and then look at growth secondary. So that's, that's something that I think we did a very good job of hunkering down, maybe not as good of a job of being offensive as quickly coming out of that cycle. Do you see any parallels between where we are today and where we were in the GFC as it relates to, I mean, you just made the comment, sort of maybe we could have been a little bit aggressive coming out of it. So here we are, you know, uh, 10, 12 years later, we're in the midst of a completely sort of different crisis. And at the same time, lots of people are out there looking for opportunities and trying to either gain conviction or stay stay safe, if you will. What's any parallels between now and then that you're kind of working through? Yeah, I think there are parallels between all these cycles. I mean, you know, the, the, certainly, you know, one of the things is real estate is a volatile business. It's a very capital intensive business. And because it's so capital intensive, you know, at the margin, changes in cash flow, changes in capital allocations can make a big value difference, a big opportunity. So you couldn't buy public markets reacted very quickly in 2008 and 9, as you point out, Willie, with stocks really getting hammered very quickly. Private markets did not react that quickly. It was very tough to buy assets in 2009, 2010, even if you had the guts to do it and the money to do it because it, was, it wasn't that much available. People didn't change. So you see the same thing now. Velocity goes way down. People don't, the pricing uh, doesn't adjust immediately. And then you see the opportunity. This actually has more pressure on cash flow this particular cycle than it was in that cycle because you have hotels and retail and some of the other things have been hit really hard. And so I do see some analysis, but I also see some differences in this cycle. Even going back to the 90s when we built the company, there were lots of similarities in that cycle too, but there are differences. You want to pick the similarities and you want to know what the differences are before you make these investments. I heard Colin Powell speak once, Mike, where he said that um, when making decisions in the military world, that if you don't have 40% of the needed knowledge, you don't have enough information to make a decision. But if you wait for over 70% of the of the needed information, you've waited too long and that you haven't really made a decision. You've just been kind of forced into your plan of action. As you think about where we are today with COVID, there were, you know, Goldman's earnings today, JP Morgan's earnings yesterday, the loan loss reserves people are taking, where are the kind of markets going? Do you feel like we're in that zone right now of do we have 40% of the, of the needed knowledge or is it too early? Um, or are people right now, are we, uh, because you know, Moderna comes out with uh, um, news today that uh, on the, everybody who they tested on their vaccine came back with antibody development, are people, are we over 70%? People should actually be jumping in and starting to make decisions immediately. It doesn't feel like we're over 70% from where I sit, um, but that, that's what makes the market. I do think that this is a really tough one to, to analyze because it's a big unknown, right? If the virus, the virus, we were living, we were going along, and the virus was a really shock. It, it, it decimated certain businesses and decimated, obviously had a big hit on real estate. So I personally don't think we're at the 70% point in your analogy. I think we, we have to be respectful. We don't know. I think being patient here, but being ready to pounce is, is probably the right strategy. I think there's going to be um, some fallout from this, even if there's a, I think the stock market seems to be betting on a V-shaped recovery. And, a, and I, but I think that's a very narrow stock market with 10, 12, 15 companies are driving that. It's not a broad thing. So if you look beyond that, you look at really what's happening in Main Street and out there, I don't think we're at the 40% yet to be, where we're going to stop pulling the triggers unless you start shooting blindly and hitting people. And I think you'd rather you know, be careful in how you aim to get somebody. To your point, as it relates to the markets, I just this morning was looking at, you know, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, both trading at about 11 times earnings after both just crushing their quarter and clearly showing how strong both franchises are. And then I was like, I wonder where Tesla is in comparison to JP Morgan's market cap. And I go over to Tesla and they're still, you know, they're right around JP Morgan's market cap. And then I went to their PE and obviously it's just a, it's a line sideways. There's nothing there. And it, it made me think back to that company globe.com that you and I both probably remember from 2001 or 2002 that had some outrageous market cap and ended up turning into ether. And I'm not trying to say Tesla's gonna go to ether, but at the same time, it does seem 
to your point, Mike, that there's just a very small number of companies that are just getting an incredible amount of inflows right now on this kind of bet that there's some absolute change to the underlying fundamentals of the market and how we as an economy are going to function going forward. Do you think that's overblown? Well, I'm not a stock market guru, but I've been perplexed. The market seems to have been ahead of itself, which it normally is. You know, the public markets tend to be predictive. Um, real estate markets have gotten hit harder than, obviously, the certain sectors like travel. It's gotten hit hotels we talked about, leisure, airlines. So it, I, I think that there's the one of the questions you raised early on in your introduction is, what will happen when the government, if and when the government reduces the stimulus that is put into individuals or the economy? You know, what will happen to collections and rent? That's an open question in my mind. If that $600 went away, you point out, even went down to 400 So some of the things I think we haven't been through is we've been, I don't want to say propping up the economy, but we've been giving it some stimulus, rightfully so. The Fed stepped in as a backstop. Um, there was stimulus to people's spending and be able to affordability. I, it's going to be when we can get back to self-sustaining. I don't think that's – I think we're going to go through a further – contraction and dip before we get to that point is my my view. Uh, but I, so I think the stocks are predicting we're going to be probably back fourth quarter, first quarter of next year maybe. And I, I think that's an aggressive prediction, and I wouldn't want to underwrite stuff on that basis. So when you joined Vernado and owned a bunch of malls, you continued to buy malls through the early 2000s and then divested from the malls in the sort of 2012 to 2014 time and were completely out of malls after 2014. Right now, that looks like an incredibly smart move. Um, talk for a moment about retail and the mall business, which you all were in and out of. And I also understand you're still on the board of Renato, so not looking for anything in this discussion as it relates to Renato going, but trying to look at that from a standpoint as it relates to being heavily invested in malls and getting out in the early 2000s, which now looks incredibly prescient. And then at the same time, Renato also owns a lot of what I call retail, a lot on Fifth Avenue and things of that nature. What's your general as it relates to the retail world? Well, I mean, retail, retail, um, I, I actually, Steve and I, not to really saw retail was saturated. It, it was so much retail development, so much retail we used to invest in areas where the retail square feet per person was relatively low. That was always a measure we looked at very closely, and that just exploded over the time. So we thought retail and some of the retailers and product was very und undifferentiated, and we felt that we felt it was in a secular decline, and we said, let's get out. We also felt like we weren't strong enough, and the mall business was going through a big consolidation. So people like Simon, who's terrific operator, Todman, you know, Mace Rich, or – all these people were growing. We didn't feel we could compete with them with three or four or five malls. We were very focused geographically, but we felt like that was something we wanted to get ahead of that curve. And I think both of those were really, really good moves. We did move very heavily into street retail, which was an unbelievably great business until recently where you've seen that softening a lot because you don't have tourism. You don't have, obviously, you probably got too much. Too, rents went too far, too fast. Um, that business, we really was spectacular business for 10, 15 years. But that business is going through a change right now. Again, there's going to be less of it, but there's a fixed amount you can manufacture on Fifth Avenue and on Madison Avenue. So if that business comes back, and that will be a factor of rent, rents resetting, people resetting, and people being there to spend the dollars, I think that might be more vindicated over the long term. But certainly that's taken a hit in the short term. And we did think that retail, street retail, high street retail, was a better retail format for us than Wall, for sure. I think that has been proven out, but that we still have to finish the chapter on the retail, uh, street retail. Talk for a moment about Toys R Us while we're talking about retail. Because oh. when, <laughs> when, when, the, when the deal was announced for you and KKR and Bain Capital to buy Toys R Us, I think everyone out there sort of sat there and said, wow, two big PE firms with an incredible real estate operating firm. That is a recipe for a massive success. You're going to get the best of all worlds. You're going to get great operations from the people at Bain and KKR. You're going to get the on the street knowledge of the retail market from the Vernado crew. Uh, not so much. So talk, talk for a moment about 
about the Toys R Us investment and how that unfolded? You know, we would, I look back at my Fernando days, and I think we did $18 billion of acquisitions when I was there. And, you know, I, I think for the vast majority of them, like 90 plus percent, I think I was in four or five deals, worked out really, really well. You picked one that did not. So, <laughs> but it, it was, it really worked out really well initially. You know, like most things, the, the Bain and KKR were incredibly good at what they did. And we did switch managements up, run a new management. We, we got the EBITDA up from $750 million down to, we took it down to six fifty, dollars all the way up to over a billion, over a billion dollars. So at one point, I think that we thought we had maybe a triple on our investment now. We went in there thinking that the stores were worth more than the business at that point. So the floors were in retail. We used to play around with retailers where the real, real estate assets of retailers were worth more than the actual retailer potential or gave you a floor that was an option, a very low, you know, there was an option floor in case the retail business didn't work. You could liquidate the stores reposition them, et cetera. That was the original start of Venator. That's what Steve had done with the two guys from Harrison chain. That's what we did with the Alex Anders department store, which I also was president of in this site. So it, we had worked this before successfully. The problem was we held on so long in toys. By the time that toys business started to tail off, we didn't monetize it. We didn't monetize those stores and those values of those stores for the first time kind of in real retail history, which was happening in retail, started to go down, not up in value, even without with Toys R Us might have been the best tenant for them, or you weren't necessarily better off if Toys R Us wasn't able to pay that rent. So we ended up with a, unfortunately, it was a very leveraged situation. We had a lot of leverage on it. We ended up having a diminution of value that I think came on from holding it too long and really not monetizing those stores early enough, which were a really good deal. If we'd done that in the first few years, we would have made a lot of money, I think, in toys. Let's shift for a moment to Office. The Office portfolio that you put together at Bernado uh, is um, obviously extensive, incredibly well-located properties. Um, what's your thought as it relates to Office and the future of Office? Everyone seems to be kind of scratching their heads right now of, well, it's going to change completely. No one's going to go back to the office. Some other people who say no, people will keep going in and out. Jeff Blau, our mutual friend, was on the webcast uh, about a month ago talking about um, getting people back into offices. Um, what's your take on, what, what's your outlook as far as the office environment? Are people still going to need to come together to exchange ideas and be creative? Is what you and I are doing right now sort of here forever and we can stay in this dispersed model and and office is going to be under pressure a year or two years from now. What's your thinking about office? You know, I think it's too early to take the data points we have and make predictions. I think people make big mistakes thinking that these things are total changes. I, I personally think there's a, there, there is a real need to be together in an office environment to create a culture, to onboard people, to build a company, to, to assess in our company. doesn't mean we can't do more virtually with technology. This would not have been as easy to do years ago. And I do think at the margin, if people are scared to get their work and get up to work and be at work, that's a problem. But if you get rid of, if you come up with this vaccine for this thing, I think you might see a more rapid recovery of the office uh, business than you might think. I, so I wouldn't pronounce it. I wouldn't pronounce it dead. I do think in the short term, it's going to, there's going to be short term negative pressures on it. Because I think people will go into open, if you think of the office model, people go into open office space, high density, I mean kind of low per, low per foot numbers per person. There, there are open floor plates. Then you have the WeWork model, which is even dot squared on steroids. And I think people are revisiting that, and it will have to do that during the COVID crisis. But I'm not sure where we're going to end up in that thing. I think it's going to take some patience to see where that ends up. I personally think, if that over that could get oversold and be a great buying opportunity for offers, because I think the public markets are pricing this or some of the office companies at a very low price per foot. And I don't think it's going to be cheaper to build products. So assuming people go into an office eventually after this thing's done or go back to that more for most of the way they conduct business, that could get oversold. I do think at the margin, people might be working more from home, might be working more virtually might be taking advantage of technology, but I don't think it'll be like no office, you know, I don't, and then office. I think it'll, and I think people who are seeing a moment in time projecting that may be making a mistake. 
when I was looking at your office holdings at Bernado, I was um, I noticed the refinancing of 1290 Avenue of the Americas back in 2013, where you put a $950 million loan on that at a 334 coupon. I, I can only imagine you turning to Franco and just being like, man, we really, we really timed this market perfectly. Um, who would have thought we'd have financing costs below that right now? But to talk for a moment about I mean, 2013, that's st that debt's still on there. I mean, you got to be able to make money on an asset like that at 334 debt, don't you? Yes. Well, I thought that, but now uh, you didn't even tell me that that deck could probably refinance today on the three. And, and uh, I'm not sure we get $950 million on it or not. But um, yeah, when we, like, I've done a lot of financing in my career and was pretty good at it. You have to take it when the money's there, you take the money and you, and when we could get 10 year money for close to 3%, 323, 334, we, and you have an asset which you're earning five, 6%, cash flow pretty reliably on or more, and you hope that the spread's gonna increase over that 10 years, that's usually been a recipe to make a lot of money. And that simple math, you, know, you, don't, have to, you don't have to go to Harvard Business School for this math, that's pretty, even University of Rhode Island people can handle that one. So, you know, when, I, when we got that thing, I said, I was thrilled with that, and I've never looked back. I think that was an unbelievable, uh, unbelievable financing for that asset, for any asset at the time. Now, subsequently to that, rates have continued to go down, right? And so, and spreads may have now, uh, increased a little bit, but you still, your all-in cost of that asset probably would be less than that today. But I, I personally think that's why I think if you could buy good assets with yield on them and the financing costs low, you might not see as much of a diminution of value in the real estate market because the financing real estate the cost of money is one of the biggest costs of an asset for real estate, that's headed down. So that might offset some of the cash flow diminutions you're seeing during this period. So that was a fixed rate loan, I'm assuming, back in 2015 yes. to 334. So you're sitting here today and I say to you, you know, we can do a, on a multi-property, we'll do a, a, a 240, 250 coupon and you know, on an office property, we can do you, you know, 3%, 325. Are you fixing today or are you floating today given your outlook on rates going forward? You know, I don't think, I think the mistake is certainly from 2008, 2009, a lot of research came on interest rates, you know, and I think Ken Rogoff and, you know, lots of books this time is different. And I think we saw rates stay stubbornly low for longer than anybody predicted. You remember at our conferences, some of our economic friends in their forecasts, and I keep those forecasting. And the key to economic forecasting is forecasting often to a different group of people because, you know, those forecasts have never come close to being true in terms of rates getting back into the fours. So we're in a, a kind of deflationary environment. Rates could stay low for a very long time. I still personally think if I could fix like an asset like real estate, which is very capital intensive, if I can fix my costs in the twos for assets that should be yielding five, six percent, that's a recipe for making lots of money and you also hedge against inflation because I do think what we're doing is it's got some inflationary pressure somewhere down the line. Now we haven't seen that come, but real estate tends to work very well in an inflationary environment. So I would still take the money, Willie, but you know, I, I, you know, I might be wrong looking back 10 years, but I'm still going to have the money at two and change percent. I'm going to take care of the money. Um, you, your, your comment, talking about Ken and his predictions that rates were going to go up. I, you know, I love Ken Rosen and he's an incredibly insightful economist, miss, but I, I didn't I, say I, Ken. I said some economics. Yeah, no, well, I'm just, I'm just saying, it, I mean, every year it's, they're going to go up and every year they don't go up. And I, and I keep waiting for, you know, every clock is right, is correct. A broken clock is correct twice a day. I'm, I'm waiting for the yeah. clock to be correct at some point. Um, on I that, think Howard Marks, I think one of the things you learn over years of investing is, Knowing what you don't know, the known unknowns. You, yeah. We don't know what's going to happen with COVID next year. So how do you underwrite that Colin Powell question? Where are we in that cycle? Will there be, how, where, what are interests going to be doing? And as you know, that's a big part of the course of our business, rates and money and, and rates. When you're putting 60 70% leverage on a property. So I think we just don't know the answers to those questions. And we don't want to fool ourselves to think that we've got a magic crystal ball. So you have to, you have to underwrite things that you can get through if you're right or wrong on some of the predictions you're making. So on that, uh, back the clock up to 2014 and you and I are sitting around a conference room in Chicago and there's some very, very 
insightful people in the commercial real estate space who are sitting there trashing the single family rental space. And I'm sitting in the back with David Nethercutt and the two of us are talking about SFR and a lot of naysayers in the room. And, and you and I can remember somebody said, you know, nobody ever rent, never, nobody ever washes a rental car. It's going right. to be a nightmare to try and manage those homes. You um, didn't listen to all of those, you know, negative commentaries on the SFR space and have actually played a very significant role in invitation homes and the growth of the SFR space. Um, and there right now is a huge amount of focus on single family rental as people sort of can't afford to own a single family home, yet they want the space and the, and the, uh, the amenities, if you will, that a single family home provides. Um, first of all, you know, tell me what gave you the conviction to go down that route to begin with when there were lots of naysayers. And then obviously you've got to be feeling pretty good about that asset class right now. Yeah. Well, I give, we give some, you know, kudos to, to Barry Sterling, who you mentioned earlier in the show, Barry and I are really dear friends. Great, great. We've known each other, done deals in the 80s together. And, you know, when, when everyone said that was just a trade, not a business, Barry and Blackstone, those two, and some others too, but led by Barry's vision and, the, and, and John Gray and the Blackstone people, they plunged really heavily, as you know, into, into, into the single-family home business for rent. Not, and, you know, recognizing they might have been buying it also – getting home price appreciation was going to be a factor in those returns, maybe outsized returns then. They thought there was a long-term business in renting those at a, at a good enough yield, like multifamily product that you do so much of, and be a very attractive uh, long-term investment, not just a flip or a trade. And I think, you know, after five years of doubt, or six years of skepticism, the jury's in on that. You get Imitation Homes is a multi, you know, one of the largest suites out there and performed exceptionally well during any of these cycles is, is built itself into a behemoth and uh, compares favorably to any of the multifamily companies. You know, I think in, in terms of rental growth, rental achievement on rents, rental spreads, uh, margins, which people didn't think you could rent, you could manage these 200 houses because, you know, if you remember the 200 rooftops. So, I think the jury's in. There's enough data to suggest that's an ongoing, strong business. And I was fortunate enough to invest early in it. And, you know, as I said, I give Barry Sterling a lot of credit. He called that early in, in the Blackstone. And they voted with they, – they didn't – they had a lot of conviction. They plowed billions of dollars into that sector. And then, you know, we, I was lucky to be involved with Barry and be on the boards. And we merged at the Waypoint. And then that was Sway. And then we moved into Colony. And then that merged into Invitation Homes. So and we're now – now we're all part of this giant company. We've achieved great scale in putting those businesses together and great results. So that's been a good story and a good investment. I think it will continue to be a terrific investment going forward. So you you know, you were a master of the universe at Goldman Sachs and at Vernado, and then you you leave and you're now chairman, president, founder, owner, principal. I mean, you got more titles now, Mike, than anybody that I know. Um, and you're in lots of stuff. You've got your family office, you've got Imperial, you've got Cadre. Talk for a moment about just, you know, where are you spending your time and what's got you really excited right now as it relates to not only where you're putting your dollars, but just, you know, what to you is, is gaining your attention and where's Mike Facitelli actually spending his time? Well, I think it's, you know, it's, first of all, I'm not big on titles. I think I came as a, a street kid and never really cared about that stuff. Um, but, you know, being big titles, but really no, no, no big assets back is easy, you know. So, I, you know, obviously this is much smaller scale what I've been doing compared to, you know, running a Veneto or being, you know, head of real estate at Goldman Sachs or some of those things. But clearly, I, I, when I retired from Goldman, I wanted to do things like be with fun people like Barry and I invested in single family. And that's a great run and, you know, do stuff you can make some money on and then have some fun by the same time token. And I managed to do a lot of that until recently. This, this uh, you know, we invested in the Milwaukee Bucks, which was, you know, looked on paper and still I think is an unbelievable investment. Um, we obviously can talk about that a little later, but you know, that was something I put a, a, a big effort, a big amount of money in, a big effort in. And was lucky enough to have Wes Eden and Mark Lashley and as the lead partners in that deal and Jamie Dinan, and great people to work with. So I, you know, I, I did that. I, I did some individual deals and what, um, I got involved in multifamily in New York and did really well. And, 
you know, it, so we've, we've built, we're building a hotel in Miami. That's, that's going to be a challenge, you know, with retail on the bottom. So we've had our share of things that were kind of off timing, but, but I just said, if we can create assets that would be for the long term, create wealth, I thought that was a good way. I'm, you know, I'm 63 years old. You know, I've done really well. I thought if we could really build these companies and I could help some other people grow their businesses as an advisor or an investor, and then actually with my company and my people build other assets that were forever assets, I thought that was a good mix for this generation. I have think, thought this may be another great opportunity in real estate, depending on what happens with the COVID crisis and what happens with real estate. There's plenty of capital out there right now, but I think you could see this be a great opportunity in real estate principling again. So maybe I've got one more rodeo in me for, before we're done in terms of going with more scale because it wasn't an easy place to invest from 2014 on. Pricing was very high. You pointed out stocks. It just was a very tough investment market, and I invested very defensively during that period of time thinking that not that COVID could come, that we just were at the tail end of a cycle and that you could have some corrections in value. So I personally think this might be a flip in that, and it might be a really good opportunity, depending on you know, really what happens over the next six to nine months, 12 months. Talking about potentially having another rodeo in you, um, I don't think there's any doubt that getting on a bull and riding a bull in the commercial real estate space for you is, is A, you've got an incredible track record, and that stuff you've always done. Cadre is a little bit different. In my mind, it's sort of like you getting on an electric bull and then putting it up to like 11 because <laughs> it's a totally different play. Talk for a moment about sort of fintech and what's what you've been able to see at Cadre and has Cadre evolved, if you will, as quickly as you thought it would? Because we've all been, I mean, when you were at Bernado, the, you know, and like I at Walker and Dunlop, I, I get an email every other day from somebody with some great new fintech or prop tech idea. And would Walker and Dunlop like to do this or do that? And I'm sure you right. see a lot of that. When Cadre was put together, I will tell you, there were many of us who sat there and say, man, that is one heck of an investor base. And they've got, they're going to put together an incredible platform. How has Cadre evolved? And what's your view on sort of fintech at this point as it relates to commercial real estate? I, I, I think it was all of those things. It was sponsored by great people. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the young CEO, Cadre, Ryan Williams, who's um, you know, young, 30s, African-American CEO, really terrifically talented guy. And the investors is like a you know, who's who in venture capital and real estate. So it had all the ingredients. I think you know, um, it, it brought a lot of technology to, to an ease for a transparency to investors on a deal-by-deal -deal basis to – not the fund model, and then it augmented that with managed accounts for people who wanted to have allocation across the deals and satisfying both kind of a, a single, you know, each individual deal investor as well as a more program, programmatic investor. So I think it, it, it lived up to that promise. It probably was a little slower in terms of the ramp up than everyone thought it was going to be. Um, I, my role at CADU is to chair the investor committee, which I think we've done a very good job of underwriting defensively during this period. We focused mostly on multifamily, mostly on protected assets in case it was a downturn. We were trying to make, we, I always thought the thing that people invest in these areas are already wealthy. They don't want to become not wealthy. So you, first thing is don't lose the money. Don't lose the principal. Then make some money on top of that. That's a very simple rule. Come from Providence, Rhode Island. Don't lose the money. Make money on top of that. And I think that we, um, we, we've seen that happen, and we've done a really good job at Cadre. I think the COVID thing set us back a little bit, too, because it's hard to, you know, deal flow stop, and it's very hard to do deals, and we have a machine to put through a certain amount of deals and manage a certain amount of deals. So hopefully we'll kind of ramp back up and be able to buy deals once we can travel and underwrite effectively. And um, so I still am very optimistic on Cadre's future. I would say it's been – it's not been exactly the ride I thought it was going to be. For the most part, it's been the right direction with a few bumps in the road. So you mentioned previously, Mike, the Bucks. Um, we've got the NBA pulling everyone together down in Florida to try and get to a season. Um, here you guys were with an incredible franchise, a new uh, stadium out in Milwaukee, the Fiserv Center. Um, you have a lot of retail on the bottom floors. I mean, everything was lining up for sort of 2020, 2021 to be just a friggin' windfall as it relates to the Milwaukee Bucks and the franchise you invested in. And boom, we've got COVID. 
um, first of all, do you think the NBA is going to be able to pull off the season? Um, and second of all, just sort of your outlook as it relates to, uh, you know, if the season fails as it relates to them trying to get it done and having to send everybody home, what's that say about getting the 2021 season sort of back on track? Well, I sure hope we play basketball again. You know, um, obviously we're still dealing with cases of COVID in the league and in certain teams, people are certainly still feeling, you know, concerned about playing. Uh, I think Adam Silver, who's the commissioner of the NBA, has done a fantastic job navigating through a very uncertain, unpredictable situation. The owners have been united and trying to do the right thing. And, um, you know, we're represented by Mark Lazary and Wes Edens as the two primary governors and Jamie Dynan. And, you know, we were having a magical year. Like we were having, you know, we were top five NBA, uh, all-time NBA records. You know, the new arena was crushing it. Stuff around it was full and thing, and you know we never underwrote COVID, and it did come to a screeching halt. We haven't had an event since March 11th in the arena. Um, we have no idea when we're going to return to that. Even if this is successful in Orlando, which I am knocking on wood, hoping it's successful, because um, I think people are starved for sports, they're starved for content. I think the ratings going to be super high. I think there's a lot of interest. It's going to be if we, we can get it done, and I hope it does fly. Um, I think it's going to be great, but it's certainly not um, for a local Milwaukee, you know, uh, perspective. It, it's better than not doing it, but it's not. It's not great because, you know, we don't we don't have a full arena. We don't have the ancillary benefits for that. So hopefully we get that going. And I'm certainly open by the 21 season. There'll be, by the way, if even if COVID persists, I think and somehow this season got there'll be another season of basketball. Even if we play this year, it might get delayed a little bit, and we'll figure that out. Everyone's committed to playing. How we play and what kind of precautions we're putting in place and what kind of event is still, you know, kind of real live TV. And I, I think we'll be very, we'll be very cognizant of learning on the ground. But I'm hoping the Milwaukee stuff in the arena and around it gets back to its full potential by certainly for the 21 season. You've invested in a lot of real estate. You've invested in a lot of private equity. You know, is is investing in the Bucks the most fun sort of work that you've ever done? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's been great. It's been a, it's been it's been a great uh, partnership. As I said, I was fortunate to be. You know, we had Wes Edens really put the deal together with Mark Blasi, and then Jamie Dine and I came in. We had a bunch of local owners who've been terrific. We have a great group of people. We we turned around a franchise that was one of the, in almost every category in the, in the bottom few in the league to have a contender for the championship, one of the MVP on the team. And we have a brand new state of the art arena that we built on time at a reasonable cost below budget and stuff around it that was excelling and doing great. So we, we've had a great five year run and you know, we did, we did it to make money, but we really don't didn't do it for that only. We figured if you could have something that was that special and that uh, kind of, Bulletproof, we thought, and then you made you 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 sort of did really well on the team side and made money. Beside, we achieved all those things, and then we ran into COVID, and so hopefully COVID is a temporary disruption. But it's been one of the more fun things I've been involved in, and it was very. If you look at the valuation, we bought the team at five hundred and forty million, and you know valuations were almost triple that last year. So I am still optimistic that valuations will come true. What, by the way, what's the Greek freak like? Good guy. Great guy, works his butt off, super guy, super dedicated, super, super guy. It's one of the great kid, great guy. Yeah, so to close, because I only got another minute before we're, we're out of time, you and your wife Beth have been wildly philanthropic and have given back in, in many um, different areas, both from an education standpoint, you've given a bunch of the University of Rhode Island, Beth's on the board of Dartmouth. Um, What's the what's the focus from a from a giving back standpoint right now, Mike? Um, given um, the diverse interests you both have and, and and where you're trying to invest as far as the future and giving back to society, I think we you know as, you know my wife was father was a pediatrician, so as you point we, you know she grew up I think upper middle class I guess in those days, but you know I think we both she came from Lowell, Massachusetts, like a pretty impoverished uh, area, so. I think, you know, we both talk about giving back to education, which we were both benefactic. She was Andover. She was different. She, was, she had a much more expensive education. She Andover, Dartmouth, 
I have a business. I did it at North Providence High School, University of Rhode Island. I have a business for much cheaper. So the um, but the truth is that you know, we both believe in education. We believe in mental mental helmet, wellness, children. So we support things that around those initiatives. You know, put our time and resources where we can make a difference in communities which need help or with people, you know, we, we're very involved. I'm on the board of Rockford University. She's on Bob from Mount Sinai and others. So we, we, we're trying to give back and where we can make a real difference with our capital and our time over long periods of time. And, you know, my mom, going back to my mom, she, you know, she did say, you know, if you're successful, be really nice to people because, you know, when you're not, you want them to reach down, not pound your hand, but lift you and give you a helping hand. You also want to help them out if you can. If you're fortunate enough to have, uh, have those those attributes help them out. And I think my mother was not educated, but she was smart. And I think those, those words are something we try to embody in us and try to teach our kids that as well. Um, I greatly appreciate you taking the time to share your insights on the markets, talk about your career. Um, thank you, Mike, very much to everybody who joined us today. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, we'll be back next week with uh, Dr. Larry Sabato and uh, Mike. Uh, I wish you great health and uh, continued success, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you, Willie. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.